Rowdy McLean, welcome to 2020 Revision. Great to be here, mate. Now, you're a leadership speaker, a consultant, a facilitator and mentor, so you're the perfect guy to, to chat about 2020. Um, how's it been for you? Well, what a year. I, don't, I think every single person listening to this would have the same sentiment, you know, like it's been the weirdest year ever and who could have ever predicted it to be the way that it has been like nobody saw it coming now you're you conduct a whole lot of live events a, around the country and what you do in the the public speaking space so that i imagine pretty much would have gone out the window in march so take me through it from your point of view and and what you had to do to survive in in 2020 yeah i, I was uh, speaking at a conference in adelaide on the 13th of march and uh, you could tell the change was in the wind then. And I got on a plane to fly back to the Gold Coast on the 14th of March. Uh, by the time my plane landed, 50% of my forward bookings had disappeared. And over the next week, the other 50% disappeared. And, and uh, no, I, I, I really wondered, you know, speaking at live events, what, what was going to happen. And I came to the conclusion that virtual was, was where it was going to end up. So, I spent the next three weeks building a studio at my home. And uh, then I started doing weekly uh, masterclasses to get used to the art of presenting virtually and um, incorporating multiple cameras and sound decks and the, all the things that you thought you'd never have to do. And uh, I learned, you know, I, I went through three years of change in, in you know, less than three months. and. It was quite exhausting, but in the end, it turned out to be really rewarding because, uh, you know, most people, I think, when the when the crisis hit, sort of went, oh, wow, and and, and took a long time to pivot or shift. And, and I, I was pretty fortunate that I got started earlier and, and I reaped the benefits of that. You know, I've, I've actually done just as much business this year, but without leaving home, which is uh, sort of a terrific thing for me. The thing I... I uh, didn't like about uh, being Australia's number one leadership speaker was that I was on and off planes and in and out of hotels all the time. So that was eliminated completely for me. So to be honest, uh, I've really enjoyed it. So take me through that from, uh, I, I guess, uh, uh, how did it change from your perspective in terms of the, the interaction with, with people? Obviously, you know, there's something magnetic about being in, in a room full of people and uh, and talking them through your knowledge. What kind of techniques did you have to pick up to, I guess, have that same or a similar connection with people via doing things virtually? Yeah, so the, f the first thing I had to do was build a studio where I could engage people differently to the normal Zoom meeting, you know, where somebody sits there in their board shorts with a with a decent shirt on with poor lighting and a terrible background, I created a studio where we could have three different camera angles and, and shift between um, a presentation on a screen rather than on the computer screen. So you could actually see my hand gestures, my facial expressions at the same time as you could see the slide deck, being able to pivot to a, uh, to a flip chart and, and map out a model or an idea and then also um, shift to a, a background that was just a, a really nice presentation style background and, and doing those three things and then finding ways to get people to engage in the conversation um, took a long time to learn. But, you know, I, after experimenting and trying different things, uh, I found a way to make it work. And I've actually spoken to almost 20,000 people in the last uh, few months all over the globe like I've done presentations in the UK in Asia in the United States right across Australia um, I've done a whole series up into the Northern Territory it it's uh, been pretty pretty incredible really but uh, you know the other thing is I, I think for me my business was a hundred percent face-to-face and uh, in 2021 it uh, it'll go back to, well, it's already going back to face-to-face. -to -face. So I've, uh, I've got a live presentation face-to-face -face every day this week, which is you know, pretty exciting. And, and I've been doing some now for the last few weeks. And I love the face-to-face uh, -face and the interaction, you know, that opportunity to, uh, 
to bump shoulders with people over a cup of coffee that you never got before or or to actually hear somebody laugh at a joke rather than hear crickets when uh, when you're doing it virtually but i think but my business will end up at least 50 percent virtual and you know i think that's the case for a lot of businesses right across the globe is uh, this this forced change has really made us think about the way that we do business differently and, you know people had talked about um, creating a work from home environment for such a long time but nobody really stepped into it but when we were forced to do it uh, we did it and we did it a little bit reluctantly saying oh you know people won't be productive and that we can't trust them and they won't work as hard but all of the statistics show that they're actually more productive you can trust them more and uh, they get more done with that flexibility it's pretty crazy right but uh, the other thing about uh, I, I love about Australians is you know the government says stay home um, practice really good hygiene stay 1.5 meters um, and we sort of did all that without any resistance whatsoever even in uh, Victoria where it was at its absolute worst and and there was a, a little bit of ruckus about uh, what the Victorian government was doing but people still embraced it and you know now look at where they've gone they've gone a month now with any and without any cases and it's because as Australians we go all right well force us to change we're, we're, we're adaptable we're flexible let's get in and get it done and we I think we've done a, a really good job of it right across the, the nation so if you look at the businesses that uh, were as you said forced to make their their workers work from home and, and that trust element that you you mentioned before also about letting them do what they had to do I mean we're recording this via zoom as per the 2020 norm uh, from my kitchen table which pretty much became the the makeshift office it became the makeshift classroom what are the things that businesses learnt about uh doing things that way in in 2020 and what will change in the in the future in terms of that because of the i guess the the fact that you know most people are, seem to be happy with the flexibility and also the the cost involved with businesses that they're looking to and and also um the fact that they don't have to lease so much office space these days yeah well, what a big change and i think all of the big organizations sort of knew that and they talked about it but they never really had a go at it but you know within a few months Qantas was um, looking to get out of the lease of its main building in in Sydney because it had well one it had lost a lot of employees but it also realized that people can work from home and not only can they work from home but uh, they're pretty good at it and so I think a lot of companies have gone this was a great test and yes we can do it I, I think they also learned a lot about um, how many interactions somebody can put up with on zoom and uh, you know I worked with some big companies where they tried to do business as usual at, at the very beginning but what was happening is people were doing seven or eight back-to-back -back zoom calls in a day and it was just wearing them out so you know it, it's different to being in the office where you can have a meeting and and then sort of have a five minute break and have a meeting and but uh over over zoom it just takes a little bit more energy and a, a little bit more um focus and attention so they realized that they had to cut the amount of zoom calls that their team was doing drastically and, and make sure that that uh you know the, the little things that could be done with a phone call got done with the phone call and not only that i think we realized and we've known this for some time too but you know, nine out of ten meetings are useless to most people and so they went they went let's you know if there's a meeting let's not call everybody to it let's just if it's about marketing let's just get the marketing people in and you know if it's about uh, strategy let's just get the strategy people so instead of going we'll have uh, 20 people on a on a zoom call they went let's just get these three people you know and and at the end of the week we'll do a brief on well this is what happened in the marketing call this is what happened in the strategy call so everybody's on the loop but i think uh, we found a way to operate really really well in that environment did you notice and what was some of the feedback from the the clients that you worked with in the the leadership space those that seemed to prosper in 2020 were those that were able to turn on a dime 
they're able to adapt. And that's probably the, the key words, pivot, uh, another word that's sort of been bandied about in, in 2020. Those, those businesses seem to thrive, whereas the others that were, I guess, caught standing still are probably still standing still. You are absolutely spot on, you know. There were so many businesses who went, we'll just wait for this to pass. And, uh, you know, with the idea that it, it'd be gone in a couple of months. And then they went, oh, well, it's not gone, but yeah, maybe it'll be gone in six months. And, and then, you know, um, it, it's not going to be gone for a long, long time, even when we get a vaccine, you know. But some of those companies are just now going, oh, maybe we do need to do something differently. Maybe, maybe we need, do need to change it. And uh, they're so far behind the game, it's ridiculous. Like those companies, and for matter, that matter, those governments that went, let's pivot, let's create a new strategy and let's lean right into it, have all prospered, I think, done, done really well under the challenges that uh, exist. The, the ones who sat on their hands, uh, they're lagging and they've lost all momentum. And it's going it, to, right now is not the time to try and get some momentum back because, you know, typically in Australia, we... Uh, start to shut down on the 1st of December in the lead up to Christmas. And we don't start to wind up again until the beginning of February. So those companies, not only have they lost the six to seven months that's happened to now, but they're going to lose those two months um, in the lead up to 2021. Where it's, you know, I remember saying to all my clients, so in that, uh, those first few weeks in March, I got in touch with all my clients and said, look, uh, this is what happened in the global financial crisis. Um, we went through this uh, pattern and I think we're going to be exactly the same here. So we're going to go into shock where, uh, you know, how are we going to survive? What's going to happen? What's going to happen to the business, my, me, my family. Then we go into survival mode. So how do we get by? How do we manage cash flow? How do we pay our mortgage? How do we uh, manage our health? Uh, and once we get through survival mode we go into stabilized mode and so that's when the new normal becomes predictable day in day out and you've got the same routine very different to what it was pre-covid but you've got the same routine now so the companies i was working with once we got into stabilized mode we went let's start recovery mode let now so we were talking about recovery back in may june and, and you know what was that going to look like how are we going to shape it so now that the recovery is starting to happen those companies are starting to go we've got such a great strategy in place we know the changes uh that took place that we want to keep we know the changes that took place that we want to get rid of we we've uh, also know the character that's been revealed you know so a, a crisis doesn't create character it reveals character you know and we've seen that in, in so many businesses and in the political uh, spectrum where people have really stepped up and stepped into it and and so you know, the companies I work with have been able to look at those characters that have been revealed and the strengths that that showed up that they didn't realize they had and their their advantage in, in building uh, a business going into 2021. Let's touch on that political leadership what were your thoughts on how our leaders particularly in this country and we'll touch on the overseas uh, people in in a moment but your assessment of how our prime minister and our, our premiers dealt with this unprecedented year yeah look uh, back in january I, I did a piece on television about how badly scott morrison had handled the bushfire crisis with the trip to hawaii and like it seems like forever ago now but you know, he just didn't connect with the people. Uh, he was forcing people to shake his hand and have conversations with him. And uh, it was an absolute disaster in leadership. But what he learned between then and when COVID hit, like he obviously listened to all of the feedback or, or his team did. Somebody advised him really well. Because I think he's dealt with COVID really, really well. Um, you know, I think his commitment, his uh, communication, and the level of care that he's shown to the Australian population has been really, really quite good. And I think the other thing that we need to understand about leadership is when a crisis happens, like it's easy to deal with leadership when, uh, you know, your uh, approval ratings are high or if you're a business and the profits are great, it's really easy to lead there. The real leader shows up when, you know, things are really, really tough. And so to be fair to all of the uh, all of the 
premiers and the prime minister. In, in tough times, I think they've done a really, really good job. Having said that, you know, there's been a couple of cases where, you know, particularly in Queensland, where politics has been played with people's lives. So I've been pretty disappointed about about uh, you know people that were dying in Queensland that whose family weren't allowed to go and spend that last few few days with them and stuff like that and you know the whole thing about uh, nobody being able to cross the border but forty eight thousand people can go to the state of origin it's just uh, the, you know it, you can't bring people's lives into politics in a crisis so you know I think some of the premiers have. Uh, have done poorly in that regard. How do you get the right balance in that situation where you need to use empathy, but you also need to use strength? How do you find that really nice balance so that you're appearing as if you're going to be a strong leader that is going to get people through a situation, but also expressing empathy for those that are struggling? Yeah, it's a great question. And when I'm asked that by the leaders I work with, I tend to get them to think about the pub test. So, so if you thought you were sitting down in a pub and there's a whole heap of people there that you know, and uh, they're asking your opinion on it, if if the answer would generally get the tick of most of the people in the pub, you're probably on the right path. But uh, you know, if you said uh, uh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to bar these people from being part of this. And the response is generally, you're kidding me. You're probably on the wrong path. I mean, leadership is an absolute art, but it's also not rocket science, right? And so uh, people, people are really clever. They can tell when a leader, if you're, if you're making decisions that are self-serving, even though you can sell it with all of the spin you like, People in the pub go, no way, mate. That you know, that you got to get fair, Dickham. That's not, that's not the right thing to do. What about if we look overseas? I mean, obviously, vastly different experiences for people living in the United States and the United Kingdom. Um, granted, there's a, a much bigger population to to deal with over there. But your thoughts on, I, I guess, Donald Trump and, and Boris Johnson for for two of a, a better term. Yeah, well, you know, for, for two countries that have a tremendous amount of resources, you know, in terms of, of the size of the government and, and the size of uh, the teams that they can roll out to deal with things, I think they've been fairly ignorant of it, really. And, and I think they've, uh, they've sort of played this uh, waiting game in favour of keeping the economy um, turning over. But it's obviously cost a whole heap of lives. And, you know, now that Trump has uh, decided that he's sort of no longer president, but not going to give up being president, he's playing golf while people are dying in absolute droves. I think, you know, if you wanted a, an example of really poor leadership under these conditions, you could look at Donald Trump. If you want an example of really good leadership under these conditions, you could look at Jacinda Ardern, you know, she's... Uh, she went hard when everybody said you're going too hard, but look at what's happened to New Zealand and its economy. It's uh, rolling along nicely. Um, people, the restrictions on movement and the amount of deaths have been really quite, quite small com compared to the rest of the world. So what are the positive things we take out of 2020 when where leadership is concerned? What are the, the big lessons that perhaps some of our leaders have learned, some of our, our people in business have learned, even people in the community? What, what are those learnings? I, I think there's um, some great learnings. The first one is we're far stronger than we think, you know, and, and, and far more resilient than we think. And despite all of the challenges like if you should have had, had have sat down in 2019 and said listen here's what we're going to do in 2020 we would have went no way in the world you're kidding me but uh because it was thrown at us at the way it was we had to adapt fast and we did it we did it and we did it really well i think the other thing that uh we fight change and, you know, pretty much every population in the Western world fights change and we want things to be comfortable and predictable and, and uh, 
the same all the time. So, so we know how life's going to be, but this has proven to us that we're actually quite good at change. And uh, when it's thrown at us uh, as human beings, we're, we're adaptable and flexible and capable. And I think that's, you know, a lot of the clients I've been talking to, we've talked about running change agendas because the whole world is ripe for change right now. You know, we've been forced to change and we did it really, really well. So you know, if you were to walk into the office now and add another change to that, most people would go, yeah, okay, let's, uh, let's shift. Let's, if you can explain to me why and give me good reasons, I'll, I'll go with it. So I think that's, a, that's something that's shown up. And I think, um, I think the really good leaders have, have really risen up, you know, and, and uh, if I'm working with an executive team with 14 to 20 people, I think we've found that there's two or three people in those executive teams who are just shining lights in an era of leadership that where trust and empathy are going to be the guiding factors for organisations for the next, uh, you know, Price Waterhouse says to, through to 2030. So, you know, I, I think there's some leaders who have just shown that they're ripe to lead for the next 10, 15 years because of how they've shown up in a particularly tough time. Rowdy, you've been really generous with your time and we'll wrap things up in a sec, but I just want to get your thoughts on what you're looking forward to most in 2021. Look, I think... I think we're going to have uh, mental health ramifications from all of this, and, and uh, I'm worried about that. But uh, but the, I'm worried. I'm excited about the fact that we are going to get be able to get together and rub shoulders around the water cooler and have those conversations that help us with all of those problems that aren't necessarily seen or talked about. You know, when you pop into the lunchroom, you have a cup of coffee, and you go, uh, you know, I, I'm talking to Bob today, and he just seems a little bit off and. And somebody else says, yeah, I saw that too. Maybe we should have a, you know, catch up with him and, and see how we can help him out. I think they're the things that have been missing. And in 2021, we're going to get those back. And, uh, you know, I can't, uh, even in this month, the, just the joy of, of uh, seeing people's facial expressions and body language and hearing them laugh or, or watching them frown as you introduce a new idea or a concept, uh, all of the things that you you i've missed in 2020 so i can't wait for all of us to be able to experience that opportunity to congregate um, as human beings as we so much love to do so rowdy if uh, people are interested in um catching up with more of um your um i guess content or or uh looking to engage with you where can they find you uh just go to my website so rowdy mclean.com um, rowdy, R-O-W-D-Y, or you can send me an email at rowdy at rowdymcclain.com. Rowdy McLean, thanks very much for joining me on 2020 Revision. You're most welcome.